from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Peter Shepard Skerverd. I'm the Viotti Lecturer at the Royal Academy of Music in London and a violinist. And today I'll be talking about exploring the links between the paper holdings and picture holdings of the Library of Congress and the matchless collection of instruments here in the context of the life and work of Niccolò Paganini. I'm standing in the Whittle Pavilion at the Library of Congress, which for any violinist is one of the most exciting places to work imaginable. In the past, I've come here specifically to work with the unmatched collection of instruments. But recently, in working with the team here, the project has evolved the possibility of finding a way of bringing together what might seem dry paper holdings together with the idea of what the instruments in this collection stand for. And we're putting together a project which explores the work of the great genuine virtuoso Niccolò Paganini, arguably the most famous violinist to date. Um, and what I'd like to do today is to explore a little bit as to how the things in the collection here, instruments, pictures, music, diaries, can be used to come to a, uh, more of an understanding of how Paganini worked, how he toured, how he played. So today's going to be a bit rough and ready, and I will go through some of the objects here, some bits of music, and we'll see what comes out. I think it's a good idea, though, to begin with what it was that first impressed people. Paganini made his debut in London on June the 9th, 1831, arguably the most important concert ever to take place in England. Um, this concert was received rapturously, instantly, by press and by public alike. The plague air noted the next day. After what we have heard, how are we to endure hereafter our violins and their players? How we can consent to hear them? How crude they will sound, how uninformed, how like a cheat. When the Italian goes away, a violin playing goes with him. Unless some disciple of his should arise among us and detain a semblance of his instrument. As it is, the most masterful performance, hitherto so accounted, must consent to begin again and be little boys in his school. What had really impressed everybody was what Pagni finished his concert with. So, I won't play anymore, but it's worth pointing out straight away that this was the first time anybody had ever ended an orchestral concert by coming to the front of the stage, silencing the orchestra and playing by themselves. Playing a piece which was probably, at that point, entirely improvised. Variations on an aria by Paisello from his opera La Molinara, translated into English, Love Told a Flattering or Hopeful Tale, which in Italian is Nel Cor Più Non Mi Sento. This is how the performance was represented in this drawing here, um, done by MacLeese, and it's engraving, a wonderful uh, hand-tinted version of the engraving from the collection here. As you can see, the musicians around him are listening. Uh, it, some of the papers said that they showed on their faces, I, I think, a mixture of shock and awe as to, you know, they realised that their, their, their turn was over. This is Dragonetti, the greatest double bassist ever. Here's Lindley. And the violinist up here is Nicholas Mori, who was Viotti's pupil. And what I'd like to begin with is the fact that the way that Paganini is standing here is not a caricature. This is the way he approached the audience, standing on the lip of the stage, lowering the violin, and effectively showing the, player, the audience what he was doing. If I play the beginning of the variations from that, he comes to the front of the stage, raises the leg like this, drops the violin here, and holds the bow quite far up here.
for the first time ever, newspapers started talking about violin technique. They started talking about the fine detail. Because up to that point, musicians had stayed away from them, turned away. This had not been seen before. There were two reasons. One was to show the audience what was happening. And the other was more to do with Pagny's well-reported neurosis, which was to hide from his colleagues what he did. He famously never showed um, his colleagues the full scores of the pieces he was playing. And in rehearsals, he tended not to play at all, but tended to play pizzicato without the bow and then only play in the concert. So they were as mystified until the concert as to what was going to happen. But let's just get back to objects before we get to instruments. The Library of Congress is full of extraordinarily evocative documents about Paganini's travels. One of them is this rather romantically named Red Notebook. Um, it's quite interesting. On the cover, it says that it's a collection of sonnets, sonetti. And on the back, what's interesting is it says that it's sonnets di Germi. Now, Germi was Paganini's lawyer. But if just going through this, and today is the first time I've had a chance to spend any time with this. What's amazing is this is a, if you like, uh, an overview of Paganini's European tour, which began in 1828 with his visits, a visit to Vienna, and then moved through Germany, then to Paris, after going to Warsaw, and then to London. And it's full of things ranging from, I'll, I'll just take you through some things. For instance, here, this, there's no date on it, but this is going to be 1831. It's instructions for himself in London that he's got to take a letter from Monsieur Rees to Signor George Smart, director of the great choir of Portland's Portland. That's George Smart, who's one of the directors of the Philharmonic Society. He's been told to take a letter from Beethoven's piano pupil, Ferdinand Rees, to give to him. He's being used as a courier. There are records of having dinners with noblemen. Here, there is a list of musicians that he worked with um, in Germany, including the great cellist Dotzau, and at the top, the leader of what had been Karl Maria von Weber's orchestra, Reitziger. And even more excitingly for me, in the list of violinists here, Anton Roller. Now, Anton Roller was the son of the violinist composer Alessandro Roller, who had been Paganini's composition tutor at the end of the 1790s. So this book is, is, is filled with extraordinary things. Here's an example of touring at its most mundane. Single page, Mr. Welton, um, and it says that it's 170 High Street, and it's Welton and Sons, because this is the name of the music shop in Southampton which promoted his concerts when he was there. When Pagani was touring in England, he would go from town to town and he would, it would be the local music shop in Liverpool, for instance. It was a German musician called Weiss who promoted his concerts. Here we have a, a reminder that he has to go and meet the piano maker Stoddart, who lived on Golden Square in London. Pagani had been planning the great tour for over a decade. One of the reasons that such a lot of thought had gone into it was that effectively in order for him to go on a two-year tour, which actually turned into a six-year tour away from Italy, he needed to effectively close down his entire existence in Genoa. And this notebook reveals this. Here we have him taking inventory of his library. Uh, it gets charming. Number 16 here is a collection of um, pharmaceutical annals, including um, records of remedies and, I'm qu quoting, secrets to abbreviate life. Poisons. Quite what he was going to do with that is a little worrying. But here, the fun stuff starts. And I like to point out that in many ways, Pagani was the person who invented the notion of the superstar performing artist who taught many of today's popular musicians how to manipulate the press, and he invented the first grotesquely overpaid musician. There's a, there's a list here of how much money he'd earned in his first year on tour. In Dresden, a small sum of um, 3,000 francs down the list. London, 
100,000 francs. Edinburgh, 30,000 francs. Paris, 60,000 francs. The total for one year's touring, 352,500 francs, which is an astounding figure in this innocuous little page here. There's, much of this book is um, taken up with careful accounts. Now, Paganini's careful keeping of accounts led to the calumny, which was repeated many times, that he was parsimonious, that he was mean. And all the evidence points completely in the opposite direction. He regularly put on charity concerts. There are many accounts of him, for instance, when a concert failed because of lack of audience, not only refusing to take the fee, but on one occasion in the UK, actually giving the concert promoter every penny the promoter had invested in the concert to make sure that he didn't go short of money. Here we have a list of complimentary tickets for a concert in Berlin. He would go down to the box office before the concert started to see how ticket sales were going and to organise the comp list. Any touring performing musician today will recognise this. And usually what happens before the concert is everybody involved in the concert is basically saying, oh, can I have a comp? Can I have one? And here we have exactly that. There's a list for this one concert in Berlin of 15 complimentary tickets, which were 15 tickets he wasn't going to earn him any money from, of course. We have a list of the musicians that he worked with in Prague, including here the violinist Pixies, who had been a pupil of the great Giovanni Battista Viotti. Viotti was, in many, many ways, is regarded as the father of all violin playing, and Paganini was very upset that he never actually had the chance to work directly with him. In fact, he wrote a letter to Paris in 1820 asking if he could work with Viotti. And the last thing here, there is an entry for Madame Ciancatini, that's quite interesting, in New Bond Street in London. Um, her husband, um, Ciancatini, was a pianist who had made his debut as a child prodigy alongside Paganini in 1816 in Milano. And later, he became Paganini's touring accompanist. When Paganini discovered that British orchestras were so bad that they couldn't play his music. So for the first time ever, I say this quite carefully, he became a violinist who was touring with a piano accompanist. He wasn't accompanying a pianist in the way you would do with a piano sonata. He actually had someone playing orchestral reductions of his concertos. This hadn't appeared before. Here we have a poster for Paganini's last concert, his farewell concert in London in 1831. In 1832, the following season, you get these wonderful posters that start running that say, the fourth concert before the last concert, and then positively the last concert before the final one, running up to the final, final concert. Uh, what's fantastic about this is, first of all, the price of the tickets, which are huge, but secondly, the musicians I mentioned earlier, the leader of the concert, who would share the direction, there would be no conductor with his call conductor, but he wouldn't be conducting, he was sitting at the piano, that's Signor Costa. The leader is Signor Mori, these were both professors at the Royal Academy of Music, and Maury, like Pixies, who I mentioned a moment ago, was a pupil of Viotti. It's the nature of the concert itself that interests me. It was unthinkable until the middle of the 19th century that anybody would want to go to a concert just of one instrument. They would be too bored. It was really not until Liszt that this happened. And if you look at the breakdown of this enormous concert, it consists of Beethoven's First Symphony, then an aria, um, from Rossini's um, Barbara Seville, sung by Mademoiselle Dupuis. Then we have Paganini, uh, a concerto. It says in E minor. Uh, not, I suspect that may be the B minor concerto. Then we have another aria of Rossini. Paganini and Rossini have been friends for many years, and in the mid 18 teens, they um, spent a lot of time cross-dressing cross together in Milano and um, had a tendency of wandering around the streets dressed up with, in skirts and with wooden teeth. Um, here we have a prelude and fandango with fanciful variations. Fanciful variations, of course, fancy at the beginning of the 19th century still meant fantasia-like variations, not as the way we would use it now. Then to finish the end, end of the first half, we have an overture by Andreas Romberg. Andreas Romberg had been the violinist in the Bonn Court Orchestra alongside Beethoven in the 1780s. Then the second half, we have a, an 
Interestingly, a piece of ancient music, a piece of Arne, who wrote Rural Britannia, the soldier tired with a trumpet obbligato. Then we have a, the third piece that Paganini plays, a wonderful title, a Sonata Amorosa Galante, with variations on a tema by Rossini, composed expressly and performed on a single string, the fourth by Signor Paganini, with pianoforte accompaniments. This is very particular. This is a new thing, playing with piano. I'm going to come back to that G string thing in a minute. Then we have a duet um, by Rossini. Then we have a harp duet played by the Mrs. Eloise. Then, almost the end of the concert, we have um, his variations on God Save the King, uh, which, of course, when he wrote them were not, was not a British national anthem, it was a German national anthem. And to finish with, this is, concert is huge, probably about three hours long, finally um, Beethoven's overture, The Creatures of Prometheus. Just to go back to the fourth string thing, Paganini famously gave performances entirely on the bottom string of the violin. Let's take this instrument. I'm going to just go over to an instrument made by the same maker that Paganini built his career on, um, Guarneris del Gesù. This one was made almost two decades before Paganini's, which he called the canon, il canone, um, but it has something of the character which Paganini's great instrument had. This is one of the world's great violins. It is the uh, del Gesù, which was played by Fritz Kreisler. But the fourth string trick consisted of playing something like this. Except Pagani didn't play it like that. He played it like this. And you can hear instantly the reason. The reason was, by playing with the strings, as we call it, scordatura, which has come to mean detuned or retuned, but actually in Italian simply means tuned. It meant that the violin could project enormously. With that, as you heard, he played with the G string tuned up to a, a B flat. And this piece was then played entirely on the fourth, the G string, which led to all kinds of bad jokes. I'll show you one. Here we have uh, a wonderful little drawing uh, which plays on a number of the stories and myths and uh, habits of Paganini. One is what I just talked about, the one string trick. As you can see, he is playing a string of what might be a string of his beard which has been stretched out to his thumb, which has suspiciously long fingernails. So he's playing on one string. And in London, there were rumours that the, the hangman, whose name was Jack Ketch, was very angry about the fact that Paganini was becoming more successful with his one-string trick than Jack Ketch was, and was threatening to sue him. He's playing with a broomstick. The reason he's playing with a broomstick is because he became very, very famous for a piece called Les Streghe, The Witches, which sometimes had the title The Dance of the Witches around the walnut tree, which is perhaps less handy. So we have the one string being played by the broomstick, and there is a green devil who is sticking uh, uh, billows up his backside there. Now, of course, the, the reason for that is the association which Paganini alternately encouraged and then discouraged in order to keep the press cycle running of some kind of deal with the devil. Now, of course, he hadn't invented this. This had been invented by the violinist Giuseppe Tartini, who famously spread the story in the 1730s that he dreamt and during the night, the devil had come to him and played a piece to him, Il Trillo del Diablo, The Devil's Trill, and he'd written it down as well as he possibly could the following morning. This was clearly something which Paganini thought was interesting and useful as a way of getting attention to himself. Now, it's worth saying, why did he need to keep attention to himself? The reason was his touring career didn't begin until he was in middle age. 
It was a, the 19th century was an age of youth. Youth was everything. Singers' careers in the first two decades of the 19th century were considered over when they were in their early 20s. And most of the play performing musicians, say around Beethoven, were in their teens. So for, for a violinist to begin their international touring career aged 45 plus, they needed to have something else. And in Paganini's case, he found it was useful to utilize and deny notoriety. Here's an example of it. In 1824, Stondal published his Life of Rossini, in which he repeated the story that Paganini's gifts, his uncanny ability technically on the violin, had their origins in having spent a year in prison practicing the violin where he'd been put because he killed his wife. We have letters from Paganini where he's complaining about this, but it's interesting, he constantly allows the rumor to get going and then publishes the letters. And here's a very romanticized depiction of this um, from the 1860s where Paganini, and you'll notice that the, there are strings hanging for this from his violin. He's practicing the one string trick. Luckily, he clearly wasn't hung, so the Jack Ketch of wherever he was supposed to have spent time in prison wasn't, wasn't coming for him. We are quite used to this grotesque representation of Paganini, and the origin of it comes with the sculptor um, Dantan in Paris, who produced what he called Charge, which looked like this. This coloured engraving here is a representation of Dantan's original plaster sculpture made from life of Paganini at work. Of course, it represents things exaggeratedly. It represents the stance that I talked about, this thing with the hip out there and the, the foot up, and it represents his left hand work. Paganini didn't have particularly large hands. This is a myth. But what he had was an ability to fan the hands very open, like this, the ability for the hands to go backwards and forwards. He'd learned this from studying the work of Locatelli, who wrote whole pieces which were about this opening of the hands. But if you think about what Dantan has represented there, he's represented this, and then the hand right up high, and then the bow being held like this. So uh, it's as close to being real as possible, because quite a lot of Paganini's music demands this kind of hand position, where you get oh, more and more and more open. Paganini, as I mentioned earlier, was associated with the instruments of Del Gesù, this one particular instrument kept in Genoa today, the canon. He wasn't the first player to be associated with this maker. Indeed, prior to him, Viotti's teacher, Gaetano Pognani, had played at Del Gesù as well. Um, but I would like to talk for a moment about why it was that he favoured this instrument over others. But let's complicate things for a little moment first. Let's go back to this concert program. Here we have a program which involved the violin being tuned up a minor second, a semitone. Then we have the violin being tuned normally. Then we have the violin being played with only one string on it. And then the final piece, God Save the King, Pagani played with the violin tuned down a major third. Now, we know that he traveled with a number of instruments in a specially designed carriage. He's one of the first musicians we know who traveled with his instruments, which means we have to accept one slightly inconvenient fact, which was that Paganini was giving concerts, just like a, a rock musician does today, on multiple instruments, because you can't take three strings off a violin, um, tune up a minor third, then put three strings back on the violin, tune it down a major third, and expect it to be functioning in one concert. We have lists of the instruments that Paganini owned and uh, the correspondence that he had with makers. But let's begin, first of all, with the obvious discussion. The discussion is going to be whether he preferred to play on the Del Gesù or Stradivarius. Here we have an instrument which is not from the collection of the Library of Congress, but from the Royal Academy of Music in London, where I work. And this is the 1698 Stradivarius, which was later played by Joseph Joachim. Um, it's an interesting one to choose 
because I think it's the kind of Stradivarius which Paganini might have liked. It's the longest long pattern Strad there is. Uh, to quote someone who wasn't here earlier, it's a bit of a monster. Um, but it still has these important qualities of a Strad. We know that Paganini became enamoured with the Stradivari of the late 1690s, because in 1816, when he found himself in a musical duel with the French violinist Charles-Philippe Lafont at the at La Scala, Lafont was playing a 1699 Strad, which is known as the Lady Tenant, and Paganini wanted to get hold of one of those. Now, the qualities of a Strad of that period, like this one, are extraordinary clarity and a kind of wonderful directness of sound. Now, what's particularly interesting about the Strad is that it's even all across the range. When you go up a scale, It's, uh, the gradient is, is absolutely smooth. It's worth saying that for the beginning of the 19th century, this was not something which keyboard players or string players aspired to. And if you look at Paganini's own music, it tends to function in a different way. It functions in the way, in many ways, that the instruments on which Guarneris del Jesu's later instruments were based also functioned. This is an instrument from 1654, by Niccolò Amati, who was Stradivarius's teacher. Stradivarius himself never produced a violin that looked like this. This is sometimes called the grand pattern. Although it's not a big instrument, it's got this wonderful kind of width and depth to it. What's interesting about it is it works in registers. You have areas which work, have particular qualities. So if I go here, that's got one particular sound. You get very particular voices coming from different parts of the instrument. If you look through Paganini's Caprices, a lot of them play with that idea. You get things where he'll do here, imitating flues. And he'll answer it, imitando i corni. That sound down there, which is very different. Remember that if you play a forte piano from, say, 1820, and you do a scale up it, you'll notice there are distinct places as you go through the keyboard where the voices change, where you go from suddenly a bass voice into a baritone voice into a tenor voice. It's not even in that way. Now, this instrument, the, the Kreiser del Jesu, is as close to being a Strad looking like del Jesu of his mature period is imaginable, but still it functions with this very different manner. You get this. It has an amazing darkness and earthiness to the sound. If I take some Paganini as opposed to Cacaturian. Hmm. There's all kinds of strange harmonics coming from it. And it also, if I play ricochet on it. If you bear in mind 
how much of Paganini's reputation becomes built on extreme colours. This was the instrument for him. Paganini was uh, notorious, it was said, for going to hospitals to listen to the screams of patients to better produce these kind of gothic sounds. And when Liszt first heard him, he just notated Paganini's improvising this kind of material. This kind of diabolical music, if you like. So it was the Del Gesù was very suited for that. But I'd now like to turn a little bit closer to uh, Paganini's involvement in the instrument market and uh, particularly the ratio between the production of, a, of new technology of instruments and what was going on with Turing. This might seem a strange place to start talking about instruments. But I'd like to think for a moment as to how it was musicians expected to make money when they were Turing. Here we have Paganini in 1832 or 1833, a engraving which was published in Paris for large public consumption. Paganini, like a lot of touring artists, until the age of photography, gave a lot of thought as to how they could control and make money from their image. 4th of August 1824, this is four years before Paganini left the Italian peninsula. We have him ordering from a painter, Carloni, a hundred portraits, which would be sold at his upcoming concert at the Teatro San Benedetto. He also noted that he was looking for somebody else to sell these pictures on his account, as he didn't want to be seen to be involved with commerce directly. He wanted to make money from it, but he didn't want to see to have his hands dirty with trade. Naples, 2nd of August, 1820. He promises to send his friend, Jeremy, who originally owned this book, as far as I can see, strings. He's in Naples at the time, he's going to send them to Genoa. A few months later, he confirms that he's going to send his strings by the very next ship. He's going to call Primo Bastimento che partirà ti spedirà le corde amoniche. Then he sent the strings. A few months later, he's staying in a village close to Lake Como, and he notes he's tried a number of bows which he said are of uniformly excellent manufacture, but which for him will need a wider band of hair and a greater elasticity in the middle of the bow. Come back to that in a minute. What Pagni had realised was it was a good way of making money on tour, and prior to the tour was merchandising. A bow was easier to transport and sell than a violin. The result was bows, which as far as we can tell, looked a little bit like this which is, I've chosen very deliberately, a rubbishy bow from the beginning of the 19th century. The one thing I want to show you if, uh, before we get into some more detail is the end of the bow. This is a bow made on the Tourt model, designed and by the Tourt family, particularly Francois Tourt. If you look at the end of the bow here, which probably dates from about 20 years later, you can see it functions in a completely different way. I'd like to talk a bit about the relationship between Paganini's bow choices, iconography, and posture. I mentioned earlier that the posture in which he is depicted again and again is not a caricature. It was often said that his hands, when he was playing, because of his posture, looked like nothing so much as handkerchiefs waving on the end of two sticks. I can't really do it, because, but if you imagine that the audience had the impression of this. Now this teaches us a lot about the way he moved around the instrument. I could illustrate if I take a modern approach slowly to the beginning of one of Paganini's caprices. If you take the beginning of the 16th caprice, if you play it with a modern hold, watch what my bow hand has to go through. It's all about flying up and down all over the place. Now we know that until the middle to the end of the 19th century, the bow was held with the arm very low. That was not going to work. It's too energetic. Now, if you take that passage, drop the violin, and if I do it slowly, watch what happens. And you'll notice that for a start, 
all the string crossings are reachable just by my flapping of the wrist, as opposed to which is the violin is up there, it has to go up like this. If the violin is down, it means to get from the, the, the D string to the E string, I just drop the wrist. On top of that, because Paganini didn't hold this hand in first position here, but in third and opened back, it meant this hand could do the same. So we get this, this waving effect. Lots of Paganini's works include these leaping passages across all the strings, like the 23rd Caprice. If you use a modern hold, you get again this huge, very energetic. The violin is low. Now, let's think about something. The low violin hold was very much a feature of the 17th and early 18th century and moving the bow around like that. It was something which we find, for instance, in Italian composers such as Vitali. But bear in mind, we'll be talking about leaping bowings. There's a little piece of Vitali, and uh, a prelude, which was published in London in 1705, which is quite a charming thing. I won't play the whole of it, but I want to just observe one passage. And I'm playing here with a replica of Giuseppe Tartini's bow made by the bowmaker Antonino Arienti, from, actually who is from Genoa. And if I play the leaping passage from the middle with this middle 18th century model, model bow, with the bow with the violin low, it works like this. In fact, the lower I have the violin, I can leap all over the violin. If the violin is high, I have to work very hard. I would like to suggest uh, a little slightly uncomfortable idea, which was that Paganini was seeking a way to use the advantages of the earlier bows and the posture of the earlier violinists whilst innovating on the instrument. Now, we're used to the modern bow. This is everything that the French school were looking for, the, the disciples of Viotti, um, such as Habeneck, who directed all of Paganini's concerts in Paris, Pierre Bayo, whose tour de bow is in the case behind me, and Pierre Rode, about whom Paganini himself said that even in an antechamber of paradise, the violin could not sound better than with he. Pierre Rode was Napoleon's violinist for a while. This bow is designed to do very particular things. It's designed to carry a long lyrical line That's the beginning of the most famous of Viotti's concerto, the 22nd, which was a concerto which clearly Paganini idolised because a number of his concertos begin with Italian versions of that. Is Paganini doing as much as he possibly can to do a Viotti? The tort bow, which was perfected in the 1790s and finally gained this little addition here, the closed ferrule, probably around about 1804, which held the wide band of hair good and tight. It's very good for long lines. It's very good for very precise articulation for different kinds of... There is a suggestion that Mozart might have, might have had one, so that figures such as... are the kind of Parisian figuration which he looked to. I would suggest that looking at the iconography of Paganini and what we know about the bows that he commissioned, both at the beginning of his international touring career and the end, that he was not 
totally enamoured of the Tuat Bo. There is, of course, the drawing made in 1818 by Angra in Rome and reproduced in an engraving by Calamata, which shows Paganini holding a bow like this, which looks from the bottom like a type of taut bow, but this seems to be most likely to be a very, very long bow, which is now to be seen in Genoa, which is like a bow like this, but much, much, much longer. And Paganini sometimes said that people laughed at him and his very long bow. But the majority of representations, such as the 9th of June, 1831, which I showed earlier, shows Paganini playing with a very pointed bow, a very graceful end to the bow, which at first sight looks more like the end of a late classical or even a Baroque bow, like this. Not suggesting it was like this, but this in going in that direction. And I don't think it was entirely just the ease of movement around the instrument. Thomas Macaulay said that he didn't really understand what people were talking about, that apparently showers of notes fell from his bow like hail. Macaulay said, this eloquence is quite beyond me and refused to go to the concerts. He didn't want to hear somebody like that. He was clearly a charlatan. But in order to try and get to what Pagani was maybe looking for, we need to go to the end of his career, to the 1830s, to the work that he was doing with the maker Jean-Baptiste Villon. Villon and Pagani had had a collaboration earlier where they'd come with, up with a ruse, another merchandising ruse, to sell Paganini model violins, copies of Paganini's Del Gesù, to be marketed in two versions, one at 300 francs and one at 500 francs. The so 300 francs was the, the people's version, the 500 francs was the kind of V8 version, which, as Paganini said, was refined and had lots of special colours in it. This has not been a success. As unsuccessful, clearly, as the bows which he'd failed to sell and had been returned, which he commissioned and corresponded about in between 1823 and 1826. Let's look at what he was doing with Viome in the 1830s. Starting in about 1835, there was a Brazil wood shortage afflicting Archetiers, bow makers, in Europe. Now, Brazil wood had originally been introduced to Europe not to make instruments. Brazil wood, which we usually name by the regional name of Pernambuco, is the wood in this bow here. And the reason it had come to Europe in the first place was so that the red dye could be extracted from it. The, its usefulness as a violin bow was a side benefit. To this day, there are problems with availability to do with organised crime controlling um, the, the supply of wood and with the issues of deforestation, which bedevil the question of whether we should use Brazil wood. But this problem first reared its head in the 1830s when the supply completely dried up. And both in Paris and in London, makers looked for an alternative. Viome and um, Paganini and Charles de Berrier seems to be involved in this as well, the great Belgian rival to Paganini, came up with this. This is one of the few surviving um, Viome rolled steel bows. It has pretty much exactly the same weight as uh, a normal tourt bow. It's about 63 grams, that's the weight of the stick. At that point, all similarity ends. If I just put the two heads of the bows together, you can see the difference. Here we have the tourt bow, which, whose power, if you like, comes from a certain stiffness at the end of the bow there, which means you can transfer articulation from the wrist into this amazing concentration of sounds here, which is wonderful for Beethoven. But there's a problem. A tort bow, doesn't matter what you do about it, has a ricochet speed which is on the fast side. If I drop the bow, there's nothing you can do about that. 
Paganini utilized two forms of spiccato or staccato. He used the ricochet, for instance, from the B minor concerto, and he utilized, well, three kinds. He used, utilized the controlled staccato, which would be his own from the tenth caprice, for instance. And he utilized a, a nervous uh, a staccato, which works like this. In both directions. And you can see that a number of the pieces utilized the fact that his nervous st staccato was quite close in speed to his ricochet speed. So, okay, if I pick up this bow here, I'm going to change fiddles for a second. This, I want one I'm used to. And I do exactly the same experiment and drop the bow. You'll hear two things. One is that the attack is much softer, which bearing in mind is a steel bow is an interesting su surprise. And the other is that the ricochet speed is slow. So. It's, it's a very. It's gentle and slow. One of the things that was said about Paganini's playing was that he played surprisingly quietly. When Schumann went to hear him for the first time, he said he'd expected to hear him with a huge sound, but with what a thin sound he began. And then he described Paganini rapping, ensorcelling the audience. In fact, Schumann said, the quote, other wizards use different formulas. And it's clear that the steel bow was doing this not because it was steel. Because if I pick up this generic early 19th century non tour design bow, which I mentioned earlier, which as I said before is a kind of typical bow available to amateurs in the period and drop the bow, it also has a slowish ricochet and a soft ricochet because like the earlier bows and the steel bow, it's very flexible here. We call this sometimes a swan head bow. Uh, the, uh, there's another advantage which I'll, which I'll get to. Um, so the, a number of things emerge. First of all, this denial of the kind of proprietary tort technology here. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a big no. Secondly, information which we can get from this bow as to where it's been designed to be held. Look here. This we some, which is sometimes called tinseling, is designed to protect the stick from the sweat of the hand. The tinseling, or the winding, gives us information as to where the bow is, is expected to be held. And a modern stick is with, it's designed to cover there. And indeed, the bow is designed to function, balancing from there. On this stick, it tells you that the bow is designed to be held from here to here. And all the representations we have of Paganini show him holding the bow quite high on the stick. Let's just so the, the, the hold he's using there is with the, the, the hand quite high and up like this, and with the thumb like this, not bent, but a straight thumb. We have a, another painting purporting to be my cleese in London, which gives us a clue. In 1802 to 1803, it seems, Paganini stopped playing the violin for a whole year in order to study the guitar. And this painting shows him holding the bow on this place, but the interesting thing is about the way he's holding it. He's basically holding the bow in the way that your hand would lie if you were playing the guitar. If you play a classical guitar, you have the hand like this. He seems to have transferred the guitar hold onto the bow, and there it is. And this bow functions best if it's held there, over the tinseling. That's the 14th caprice. If I play it with the standard tort model bow, I have to struggle 
to play the three note chords without doing what we call breaking them. That's fine. Now it becomes difficult. Difficult on the, those are the flexible strings. When I get to the really tight strings, the top strings, and you get that thing which I'm sure you've heard of violinists doing this kind of cannoning effect into the, into, in, into the string. Which after a while can become quite unattractive. If you take this bow and take the same passage uh, from here, in fact I can hold three notes. It's easy. In a letter that Paganini wrote to Fium about this bow, he described why he liked it. He said that it had suples, suppleness in the entire length of the bow, and also une égalité de résistance avec toute la longueur de la shape, that the bow resisted equally the whole length of the bow. The, the letter, of course, was to a degree an endorsement. He was trying to make money from this. Um, but it was successful. Only f over 5,000 of these bows were marketed. Unfortunately, it became, fell totally out of fashion. And as far as I can work out, I seem to be the only person living who is playing or recording on one of these. We did discover something rather amusing the first time we recorded on it, which is that if you record this too accurately, the bow, because it is hollow, has an internal acoustic. And my engineer kept saying, what am I hearing inside there? And eventually we worked out that because the bow goes, it, it rings inside, he was picking this up. You can't close mic it too much. But I don't think that was a problem which necessarily Paganini was going to be afflicted by. Uh, there was one area where Paganini was trying to find a link or a compromise between what he liked about the earlier bows and the Tourt model. If you look at this 18th century model bow, and if I just take the frog out, because I always love doing this, you'll notice there is not that much hair there. There's probably about 84 to 90 strands of hair in there. If you think about the importance of resistance of the bow into the string to make sound, think about you know, how much resistance you'll get from 80 strands of hair, not that much. If I do the same thing with the the Tourt model bow from the, the Parisian model bow. When it's rehaired, there should be between 250 and 300 strands of hair there, which means you have got far more hair to drag across the strings, producing far more sound. And indeed, in 1823, when Pagani was unsuccessfully trying to come up with his own design of bow, his criticism of the bows being produced by the bow maker he was commissioning near Lake Como was that in order for the work, they needed a uh, width of, of hair, a crini, più maggior, a greater width of hair. Which is why this is kind of fantastic. This, in many ways, you could say totally hybrid bow here with this 18th century technology on there has the most fantastically wide band of hair. If I just, this is fully rehaired. It can carry as much as any tort bow. And so, in many ways, Pagani was achieving the kind of uh, compromise that it, maybe he would see it was an ideal, idealistic thing that he was looking for. And I'd like to finish by putting this bow into the context of the music that he was writing at that time. Paganini's touring life ended in 1834 with the last of his concerts in London, which were given at the Apollo Theatre. At that point, he go, went back to Paris, where he spent most of his time. He unsuccessfully tried to found what was misunderstood for many years as being what we would see a casino, but in fact was more of a uh, uh, arts club, stroke evening venue, concert hall, which should have gambling because all evening venues had gambling. This bankrupted him, which was one of the reasons he was desperately looking for money in the 1830s. His main concern was that he was a single parent and he was very worried that he was going to leave his son in penury. So the 
experiments with uh, concert halls, with endorsing instruments, were ways of trying to find a way of generating money, particularly because towards the end of his life, he gradually became more and more debilitated by the various um, things which afflicted him. I'll just give you an example of one of those. He famously suffered from Marfan syndrome, which gives very transparent skin, distendable joints, and a lack of pigment. One of the side effects of that was a problem with his sight, particularly because there was a lack of pigment in the eyes. He was one of the first people to take advantage of the new technology of coloured glasses, of dark glasses, which were marketed not for solving the problem of being blinded by light, but as corrective glasses for, for short sight. And in this caricature, which uh, uh, appeared in France in the 1830s, he's shown wearing blue dark glasses. Now, the actual reason he wore them was because in Germany from the 18, late 1820s onwards, large gas chandeliers were introduced in the middle of the theatres, which he'd come onto stage and be blinded by these lights. And he found it absolutely, incredibly painful, and he would come on stage wearing the dark glasses. And in this caricature, where he's playing you know, it's with, with, with a, a stick and all kinds of things and revolutionary things going on behind him, here he is wearing the dark glasses. But he did continue composing even though he wasn't expecting to play. And a number of these pieces appear in Vista's books. I started um, talking some time ago with this notebook here, the red notebook. And what's interesting about 19th century notebooks is sometimes a little uh, problematic for us, that unless you bought a notebook which had numbered entries in it already, you didn't use the pages in order. Now, Beethoven, in 1812 to 1813, had a target book which he bought with numbered entries in, which he filled in in order. But if you didn't buy a book which had page numbers or numbers already, then you didn't write it in order. And that brings a link between this apparently disorganized book, the red book, which simply means you have to learn how to jump around the pages, and the way that people kept albums. You'll see it to this day in the way people run autograph books. If you have an autograph book, you don't fill it in from beginning to end, but people will choose where they make entries, and sometimes you get autograph books which have an entry on page 30 and one on page 20. This is like an overspill of the use of albums in the 19th century. And Paganini's work starts to appear in the albums of the salons that he visited. And that's what I'd like to play you to finish with, which is a little, tiny little um, contrapuntal piece that he left in a album in 1838. And I'm going to do it using the Strat here and the um, steel bow. In 1831, the fashionable world reported on Paganini attending a dinner. During dinner, Signor Paganini, having desired our glasses to be filled, proposed a toast. Prosperity to artists, he said, adding a smile, for we are all artists. I hope you've enjoyed this little exploration of the world of Niccolo Paganini. If you'd like to find out more, there will be live events and a concert here on the 15th of December this year. And if you want to find out even more and you're still interested, there's plenty more on the website which is attached to this. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.